Space, the final frontier. Since 1966, Star Trek has taken us across the galaxy, from San Francisco to millions of miles away in the Delta Quadrant. Across nine different series, Star Trek has spanned across generations in the search for new life and new civilization. In comparison, the scope of this paper is a bit more limited. This paper seeks to answer how Star Trek addresses our past and our future, and what that can tell us about how to understand our present. This paper will specifically focus on three episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the fourth ever series of Star Trek that ran from January 1993 to June 1999. This paper will use two main frames in order to analyze and understand Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the Wefram-Dungs effect, as conceptualized by Bertolt Brecht in 1936, and hauntology, a term coined by Jacques Derrida in 1993, and later expanded by cultural theorists such as Mark Fisher. Henceforth, I will translate the Wefram-Dungs effect into English as the alienation effect. While I know distancing effect is typically the more common and more accurate translation, I prefer the term alienation for the subject at hand. So, what is the alienation effect? In short, it is the feeling of when the audience finds themselves unable to relate to the characters in the play, or in this case, television program. Essentially, the alienation effect is achieved by breaking the trance-like state that consuming media places us into. We're all familiar with the concept of the suspension of disbelief, and in a way, this is the opposite. The simplest and most famous method for achieving this alienation effect is by leaning on or even breaking the fourth wall. So why do this at all? For Brecht, the point of the alienation effect was to pull us out of the notion of the eternally human and to remind us that thinking it's always been this way is wrong. Things have always been done differently in the human past and things can always be done differently in our future. And this concern with temporality of human thought ties quite well into ontology. Ontology, again, coined by Jacques Derrida in his 1993 book, Spectres of Marx, which incidentally is the same year that Deep Space Nine premiered. Derrida defined ontology as the persistence of elements in the past returning to the present to haunt it like a ghost. For Derrida, the ghost that would haunt the 1990s and indeed the 21st century was Marxism, as it haunted the neoliberal world order. Since his original formulation, the concept of ontology has expanded more into the realm of cultural criticism and aesthetic theory, mainly focusing on electronic music. One big figure for ontology has been Mark Fisher, who added to the field in the early 2000s through his blog K-Punk, where he developed ontology as a critical theory for the production of culture. Fisher and Brecht connect through the act of symbolic representation in media. According to Brecht, the audience identifies itself with the actor as being an observer, and accordingly develops his attitude of observing or looking on. For Fisher, this identification can also be ontological. The alienation that the audience experiences allows the reassessment of the, of the ideological through the estrangement of the familiar. Brecht and Fisher, the big difference can be the purpose of the alienation. Is the audience made to feel alienated in order to break the concept of the eternally human? Or is the audience meant to mourn for a future that no longer feels possible in the never-ending tragedy of humankind? Here, for Star Trek Deep Space Nine, it can sometimes be both. We'll be using Deep, Deep Space Nine as a piece of media to analyze in order to perhaps bridge this gap between ontology and alienation effect, and, and see what this can tell us for our understanding of how history is presented in science fiction. Let's start with the season four episode, Little Green Men, in which Nog, a Ferengi, which is a hyper-capitalist species of alien, is set to travel to Earth in order to join Starfleet Academy. Nog will become the first of his species to join Starfleet. Accompanying him on this voyage to Earth are his father, Rom, and his uncle, Quark. 
Rom is an oafish yet kind-hearted person, whereas Quark embodies the perfect Ferengi. He's concerned with profit above all else. To avoid too much summary, on the way to Earth, the ship experiences a technobabble Star Trek classic issue, and they are thrust backwards in time, which causes them to land in Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947. Thus, they become the famous Roswell aliens. This episode is largely a comic relief episode. It deals with the, tr the Ferengi trio's horror regarding Earth's perceived backwardness, but this is always played for laughs. For example, their search for a powerful enough fuel source to send them back home leads them to finding traces of nuclear weapons on Earth that are being tested at, in Roswell, and this causes Quark to utter, to his horror, they've irradiated their own planet? And it is this juxtaposition of backwardsness that is displayed in our, in our Earth's past with the idealism of the future that causes the alienation effect in this episode. 20th century humans don't trust the Ferengi. They keep them as prisoners, and they even attempt to do medical experience, experiments on them, which are played for laughs. This contrasts the framing around the time travel story, whereas Nog is going to become the first of his kind to enter Starfleet Academy, the most prestigious and important institution that we've seen. And every human being who was on board Deep Space Nine before he left was congratulating him, was welcoming him, and was happy for him to join the institution. This view that Star Trek presents of a prejudiced, distrustful, and violent human past exists totally at the other end of its hopeful and tolerant view for our future. And remaining in the 20th century, let's talk about another episode, Season 6's Far Beyond the Stars. In this episode, Captain Sisko, who was the captain of Deep Space Nine, and was also a black man in the 23rd century, suffers an alien-induced hallucination that causes him to live, his, to live the life of Benny Russell, a black science fiction writer in 1953 America. The fourth wall is absolutely shattered in this episode. Most of the regular cast is, is present in this episode, but they're out of their normal makeup and they're out of their normal costuming, meaning if they play an alien and they're always in heavy makeup, they're just playing humans in this one. The plot of the episode is everyone has to write their own little story, and each writer is given a picture of, to write a story about. Benny, Benjamin Sisko, portrayed by Avery Brooks, chooses a drawing of a space station, which looks exactly like the titular Deep Space Nine. He writes a cool story for it called, what else? Deep Space Nine, about the black captain at the starbase 400 years in the future. Despite being, we're told, the best story he's written yet, it will not get published in the science fiction magazine that month because the publisher claims the white audience does not want to see a black space captain. And this line has a few layers to it. One, there's an element of truth to it where when a Avery Brooks was cast, there was fan negative reaction because of racism in America. And then second, by changing all of the actors into totally new characters, the audience can view the racism portrayed in this episode in a much more visceral way. These actors are not portraying the characters we have spent six seasons getting to know. They are strangers. We have emotional distance from them. And for Brecht, this was precisely the goal of the alienation effect. The emotional distance allows the audience to experience the drama at an intellectual distance, analyzing the true and political nature of the show. And this idea takes us again to the season three two-parter, Past Tense. Here, the crew of Deep Space Nine are traveling to Earth, but a transporter malfunction sends Sisko, Bashir, and Dax back in time to the year 2024. Early 21st century Earth is very different than the Earth they are used to. And this time, America's jobless and homeless are placed into cruel sanctuary districts where they are forced into squalor and ignored by the rest of society. Unfortunately for the crew of the Defiant, 
they arrived just a few days before a historical event known as the Bell Riots, in which a na man named Gabriel Bell would protect a group of hostages and prove to the rest of the world that the people in the sanctuary are good people and the cruelty needs to end. Even more unfortunately, their arrival in the past causes Gabriel Bell to be killed. In this episode, Cisco must become Gabriel Bell and literally reprogram the past as it ensures that the Bell riots occur as recorded, lest the future, and indeed the Federation, cease to exist. With the audience knowing these stakes, and hearing lines from Bashir such as 21st century history is just too depressing, we are again placed into a ontological or Brechtian distance as an audience. And taking place in 2024, the events in past tense do not feel very far away for an audience in 1995, and especially not for an audience in 2020, in which these concepts are perhaps too close for comfort. And it is in exactly why, stuck in this atemporality, in which it is our future being presented to us by time travelers visiting their past, the audience is able to reflect on what the actions in the present will lead to in the future. This estrangement of the familiar, I, such as temporality, leads to the realization that the future can be programmed by the present just as much as the past can be reprogrammed by contextualizing human action. Cisco needed to play the role of Gabriel Bell, not to take over Gabriel Bell's life, but just to play the role of the peacekeeper in the ho in hostage negotiations. And Cisco never hopes to change the course of history. Rather, it is like recording over the tape of an episode. The events remain the same, but we, the audience that has witnessed this re-recording of an episode over the same episode, have a new contextual understanding of the events. So these three episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine can demonstrate how science fiction reprograms our vision of the past by pre-programming our hopes for the future. By creating an alienation effect in the text, Star Trek Deep Space Nine demonstrates an idealist view of history. To paraphrase Martin Luther King, the arc of history bends towards justice in Star Trek. Through each of these episodes, Though each of these episodes shows a cruel and cold human past, the audience knows what it all leads to. The creation of the Federation and Paradise on Earth. It should be noted that Deep Space Nine premiered a year after Francis Fukuyama's The End of History, which posited that, which posited that human society will simply stop evolving past liberal democracy. While it is true that Star Trek shares what is certainly an idealist view of our future, Earth is, after all, paradise. I argue that Trek instead opts for another vision of our future, one that may at, the, at first sound pessimistic, pessimistic, that no matter what humanity does in the future, we will always be haunted by our past. Deep Space Nine constantly shows us humanity's past and shows us just how capable of evil and destruction we are. It is always careful to point out that these people will eventually be the ones that take to the stars. It is an encouraging message to hear, especially in, in today's world, that the idea of sanctuary districts in every major American city is maybe too believable. Star Trek Deep Space Nine reminds us that no matter how far away from our past we may get, we can never escape it. In a literal sense, for them, we may be pulled back into the past by some type of crazy, wacky, sciency fiction accident. But in a more symbolic sense, the past will always shape our present, and indeed, our future. By taking this view of our past, Star Trek is more able to inspire us to create a better future for tomorrow. Bertolt Brecht wanted his plays to act as a combustion engine for society. He hoped that after viewing one of his plays, his audience would go out and start a riot. Star Trek, on the other hand, hopes to act as a warp drive. Deep Space Nine hopes that when we go, after watching an episode, we go and start a federation. Little Green Men ends with an interesting summary of this concept. Right before Nog 
goes to leave the ship to beam down to Earth to begin his studies at Starfleet Academy. Quark says to him, just remember, under that placid Federation veneer, humans are still a bunch of violent savages. This prompts Nog to reply, maybe, but I like him. Thank you. I've been Ian Boyd, and live long and prosper.